Okay. So today we're going to look at an empire that very, very few people knew ever existed. But the Sassanid Empire has to be said to be uh, one of the most influential empires in history, except so few people had ever heard of them. Now, we've all heard of the Persians. You might have heard of the Parthians. Um, and you will have heard of the new religion that arose from Mecca and Medina in 632 called um, Islam. But had you heard of the Sassanids? The answer usually is no. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to start by looking at this map. Um, this itself is the true extent of the Sassanid, of the um, Sasnian Empire, um, or the Neo-Persian Empire in the year 621. It's one of the only empires in history that's conquered not by people, but by a religion. The Sassanid Empire falls 30 years later. Well, not so much falls, it's renamed and the religion changes. It's taken over completely by Islam. And you look at this, you see Egypt, you see the Hindu Kush in the east, you see the borders of um, India, you see the foothills of modern day Russia, you see Turkey, you see the Arabian Peninsula. This is the landscape of the Sassanid Empire. And I'm, I may like to add that this landscape almost follows the exact template of the empire of Alexander the Great in the year 321 AD at his point of death. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point to look at. The other thing to look at is this empire itself is an empire that enshrines an earlier empire, an empire associated with Cyrus the Great. And again, we've got another link looking back at Alexander the Great there, uh, that, um, that um, Alexander the Great um, adored Cyrus the Great. Um, he wanted to be Cyrus the Great. And in fact, the empire of Cyrus the Great was an empire that was conquered by Alexander the Great. So we're talking about Cyrus the, Cyrus the Great and we're talking about the great Persian empire hundreds and hundreds of years before the empire we're talking about today. Now the empire we're talking about today, back to that, is the Sassanids. The Sassanid empire began on, in the year 224 years AD and ended in the year 651 years AD. Very, very precise dates there. Now, the question is, why is it called the Sassanid Empire or the Sasanian Empire? It's basically named after one individual. It's named after the great um, Sasan, um, who was um, the last king of the Parthian Empire, the last king of the Persians. Um, and his son, that we will go on to, um, then founded this empire in his father's name, um, and hence the name Sassanian Empire. And then we've got, um, and, uh, then we've got a chain of leaders who are very much uh, the leaders that, that, that form this very, very great state. So I'm just going to, uh, I've just, I've just uh, turned to a little page in my diary to make sure that um, everything's um, flowing nicely. Um, and then what we're going to do is another map. So you're looking at this map. I'm trying to, f I'm trying to sort of give you some foothill background. And what we actually see is lots of different provinces. Eventually, um, the um, Sassanids actually conquered big tracts of the Byzantine Empire, only for the Byzantines to actually take back their bits of empire from the new and arising um, Muhammad, uh, Muhammadans, i.e. The, um, the followers of Islam. And then we look at another um, image, this one here. This image itself is showing the great empire of Darius I and um, Sirius the Great. Now, Darius I and Sirius the Great um, are people that found an empire from the modern day landscape of Iran. And this is known as the Achmenid Empire that was at its height between 522 and 486 years BC. So when this empire comes back again, 
um, 600 years later, it's more or less within the same template, except for the little bit of Greece that was never conquered by the Sassanids. But eventually, um, Mehmed the Great, when he conquered Constantinople um, on the 29th of March in the year 1453, um, he would then bring back the old word world that his predecessors had once occupied. Now, then we use the word east-west. Now, some t you know, it's sometimes good to have a live audience because um, when you've got a live audience, you can pick on somebody in the room and you can say what you interpret by the words east-west. But then again, that's not really a fair question because somebody might say east-west Berlin. Um, others might, might say it, it's um, a metaphor for si south and north Cyprus. Um, they might go east-west. You look at the Gulf War. Well, actually, there's something in all of, all of, every, all of those sort of little um, intimations of what you might think um, east-west means. Um, in lots of ways, the idea of East-West um, has been there from the period of Cyrus the Great. When we look at the likes of, of, of defeating, um, is, 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 is much later. Um, uh, you've got Darius again, another Darius who's actually defeated by Alexander the Great in 330 uh, BC. Um, it's almost as if it's a struggle between um, the Western Hellenized people and the Eastern non-Hellenized people. And the, the idea of East and West is born all those years back. Um, it, East and West, the concept of East and West is nothing to do with religion. Um, there's all, you know, when you look at the Berlin Wall, um, the East and the Westerners in Germany, um, in, in Berlin, there's still an East and a West in Germany. Um, and there's still an east and a west. It's still quoted, you know, um, the Western powers to the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003. It was quoted by many media outlets. The West defeats the East. Now that's 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 causing greater problems and that great divide. But again, it goes all the way back. It's between those enlightened ones. Um, in the East and those non-enlightened ones in the West. No matter how much you want to believe that Christianity is a good thing and it's, it's always been enlightened, the answer is it hasn't been. Because for a, for a very, very long time, you know, having street lighting, having sanitation, having medical advancements in the East when we're still eating um, off we're still we've still got no sanitation we've we've got you know we're still eating off wooden platters and and uh, so on um in in the east they've got all these massive advancements and they out they outplay us for hundreds and hundreds of years into the medieval period so there's that east west divide and it could be said that the east is backwards now it's turned around and in the west we're advanced but then again that's not exactly true, is it? If you look at the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula um, in wealth is far greater than the entire of Europe with all the countries put together. So, you know, that you can check that out the window. But enough about now, let's, let's look at this wonderful landscape. Now, when I, when, I, when I started performing the idea of having this lecture, I thought, can I do this lecture based on this building behind me. Can I just do this? Can I do, just do the arch, the arch of Sesiphon? Um, or, and, or Tesiphon, that's how it should be pronounced, Tesiphon. It's, it starts off with a C, you drop the C uh, and it's Tesiphon, not Ketesiphon, as I've said in the past. Am I gonna base the entire lecture on that? Well, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Look, look at that behind me, you know, the, the, the the arch itself is, is 37 meters in height. It's the largest non-concrete mound on, on the planet, right? It's the, it's the largest non-enforced um, um, arch, sort of um, artificial mound or whatever you want to call it on the planet. It, 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 it's, it's wonderful, right? Uh, that, 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 that arch itself um, is everything that the ancient world was and still is today. Most of that arch is still standing, except for the frontage. But the one wing on the right um, has, has now since collapsed in 1888. But I thought, no, let's actually base it on two other sites. 
Um, this, this site itself um, is in modern day Iran um, in the Persian Gulf. Um, and this itself is the palace of Adashir. Adashir, it springs off the tongue, Adashir. Adashir father had been um, Sasan. Um, and Adashir thought as an Iranian, as Iranians always do, we can be far much, we can be far better than we are. And the Arabia, Arabians, like the Mahmudins would later on, rose out of the Arabian, um, rose out of the Iranian um, landscape into the, um, uh, the Persian um, um, peninsula, um, across that landscape, all the way to the foothills of the Hindu Kush. Um, and they created this great empire. And it was created quite, quite uh, it was created like a domino effect. People, people had been under the heel of the, per, um, of the Parthians. Um, and not, the Parthians were fairly successful, but they weren't great against the Romans. A great rival then was actually the Roman Empire. Um, and Adashir thought he could do so much better than, um, than his father. But in tribute of his father, he named the empire the Sassian Empire, the Sassanid Empire. There's very few empires that, um, on this planet that are named after an individual. Can you name an empire named after an individual? Go on, go on, Keith. Uh, uh, Keithistan. <laughs> Um, that's not a very successful um, country at all because, um, um, yeah, there's only three people in it. Uh, I no, I can't offhand. No, I exactly. Can't. No, you can't. Now that that's that tells me, again, this is an empire that was going places. It was named after somebody who was very special to Adashir, his father, Adashir the first, Adashir the great, um, and again he reigned. He reigned. Um, he reigned from two two four to 242 as the sole ruler of this new empire. And his son, Shapur, Shapur I, would be the man who would defeat the Roman Empire. Now, there are very few empires in history that actually defeat the Romans. And this was one empire that defeated the Romans. Now, Adashir, um, and just type in something on here to make sure because I've got two computers um, on the go. Um, and I'm just typing that in there as well. Just to remind myself about something, bingo. That's exactly what I wanted. So this building itself, the Palace of Adashia, painted by Eugene de Flodon um, in 1851. Um, is another such wonderful site um, associated with the Sassanid world. And look at that arch itself. That isn't as tall, um, as high as the arch of Sesiphon. Um, but again, it, it towers a mighty 20 meters in height, and that still stands today. And everything that we can say about the um, Islamic world and Moorish architecture that we've already done is based on what the Sassanids offered them. In fact, the Sassanids... The Sassanid legacy, gotta be very careful, um, is the Islamic faith, uh, except the Islamic faith did not come from the Sassanid Empire. It actually came from a place on the Arabian Peninsula that wasn't under the control of the Sassanid Empire, but within no time at all, it had taken over the um, empire of the Sassanids. In fact, um, Mahmadins had actually um, conquered um, the city of Tessiphon only five years after the Quran had been um, offered to the world um, in 63, um, 637. So obviously Islam becomes a religion in 632. So Islam is moving fast. But let's try and focus on this wonderful empire. Now that is a coin um, of Adashir. Doesn't he like himself? And there's one thing that, the one thing that you see is his beard, his pointed beard. That pointed beard would be seen um, throughout the Mesopotamian landscape. You know, whenever we think about leaders throughout the Mesopotamian landscape, for, for, for a thousand years, we would see them like that. That, that, that broadcast of a Persian identity, that broadcast of Iranian identity, um, that broadcast of these people that have offered us so much. You know, when you think about it, um, that land that we're talking about, um, has given us, um, has even given us um, the battery, for example, 
uh, there's evidence that the, the battery um, may have been invented by the civilizations within the landscape. Obviously, Babylonian street lighting, um, um, sanitation, um, irrigation, um, engineering, um, and all these other things, um, all from that landscape. So we've got a lot to be thankful for, and a monetary system as well. Money, the money, the, you know, when you look at the monetary systems of the world, um, that actually almost comes from that landscape as well. Uh, you know, they've got the first huge urban areas as well. You know, cities like uh, Baghdad and cities like Ur, and uh, cities like Ctesiphon and, and so on and so on. Um, you know, there's so much to be said. And do you, how dare I not actually um, have, have, have not been there before in these lectures? And we will see a few more lectures. We look, we'll be looking at Ur next week, actually. Uh, the city, the civilization of Ur, and then we look at the peninsula um, a few times after that um, by the end of this year. Again, with this coin, um, you, you're looking at, at um, the development of our own um, script, the um, Arama Aramaic types of uh, scripts that we're actually seeing um, evolving. If you look at the lettering there, the name of this individual is Ardashir. Look at that there. Um, let's let's get the um, Let's get the annotation up there. Um, you just, you see an A and you see an R. So, you know, the evolution of our own script um, comes from this landscape. You know, so even, even our um, alphabet um, evolves from these people. Various different peoples over time. So the peoples we're looking at um, are the Sassanians today. Um, and again, this wonderful silver coin. And obviously you've got the beard. Um, the the ring the, the the ring beard the ring ringlets the um, the ringlets of the hair and, and and so on and so on and you can see the the crown of office um, and this is a landscape of non Pax Romana a very very crude way of saying it but you've got Pax Romana now that means Roman peace so the Romans would go into an area. If you had resisted Roman rule or, or Roman occupation or Roman conquest, um, like Vertingetorix did, did at, did at Lycian 54 uh, BC when you've got the likes of Julius Caesar, um, um, those people were enslaved. But if you don't resist uh, the Roman conquest, you become uh, subjects and later on Roman citizens. Um, that's known as the Roman peace. So if you don't object to what we're doing, you can, you can be yourself. Except within the Sassanid realm, uh, what we do see um, is that, that when the Sassanids conquered areas, instead of enslaving people, they just moved them somewhere else. So, it, so what we do see when the Sassanids defeated the Romans, they moved just under half a million people to elsewhere in, the, in their empire. Instead of enslaving them, they just moved them somewhere else. So, you know, and then they became subjects. It's, it's their... It's their different way of doing things um, as opposed to the Roman way of doing things. And, and again, they, they've got this great plethora of gods. And when you think about the Roman world, um, as opposed to the Persians and the Parthians, and then before that, the Babylonians uh, and, and the Sumerians and so on and so on and so forth, um, you know, lots of what we do see in the Roman world has actually come from this landscape. Um, uh, the, 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 this sort of, the, this great um, basket of civilization. And that's what they call it. It is the basket of civilization. Um, I've just got to open the door a minute because I've got a cat whining. <laughs> your little sod. I'm trying to do a lecture. You don't pay any bills in this house and you also don't get a pension. I don't get one either. Well, you know, I, 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 I love cats, really. Um, they're lovely creatures. Um, so, again, we've, we've, we, we're still on the introduction. So this is the um, Arch of Sesiphon. Now, um, when I was a child, um, I've, I've known um, about the Arch of Sesiphon um, for the good part of 35 years. I've known about it. And the reason why I've known about it is that I was home from school. I think it was about... I think it was about 1985. Um, I was home from school. Um, I, think, I think it was maybe in my lunch break or something. I can't remember. Anyway, um, and I was, 
I was sat down and I thought, oh, um, what's this I hear about the um, seven ancient wonders, right? Um, and and I read I read in a book that um, there had been a number of seven ancient wonders. And now the original list of Herodotus mentioned um, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Um, it didn't ma mention the Great Pyramids. Um, it mentioned the... Um, the, the Temple of Artemis, it mentioned um, the, the Pillars of Hercules, um, Gibraltar that way. It mentioned the, um, the Colossus of Rhodes. Um, and then there, then there was another list of seven. Um, and the other list of seven um, mentioned the arch, the arch of, uh, I used to call it Ketsesophon, Tesophon. Um, and I just thought this is a wonderful structure I, I, I love looking at it and the image that I saw was just the arch I thought this is amazing I had no no information about it and then on the news they I, I, I turned on the news and and it said oh they've actually found part of the statue of the Colossus of Rhodes and I thought oh god you know obviously I've got some sort of knack for this type of thing um, and for that moment onwards I, I, I really started to become interested in archaeology um, I had been for some time but this was when it really started so I've known about this one, and it's it's a wonderful monument because um, back in 1888 um, there was another arch standing which spring from this base over here. So there was another arch standing here, and there was another wing here as well. And this arch itself was was beautifully decorated, but unfortunately in 1888 there was a flood. And the, it, this is basically in the flood plain of the river Tigris, Tigris, just down from Baghdad. And um, and this this itself, um, I, I was I was um, captured by what I was seeing. Um, and I actually on Monday, this is all we did. We we just looked at the Sassanid Empire based around this city, and it worked. But I thought I need to add a few other things into it, and I and I'm pleased I did actually because it got me exploring a little bit more. Um, now, it got me exploring a little bit more because it started to get a little bit political. Um, because um, I'm not embarrassed to say that I was, I was, I was destined um, in 2002 to work in the Baghdad Museum. Um, I was in contact with the um, Department of Antiquities in Iraq. I was going to work in the museum. And lo and behold, we've got that illegal invasion in 2003, um, and I don't get to go to Iraq, um, except um, a few questions are asked by a few police officers to why I was going to be going to Iraq. Um, but that's another part of my life. Um, and I became very interested um, in what was happening to the archaeological sites in Iraq, uh, because the only open areas that the Roman, um, Roman military, the only open areas um, that had large car parks and stuff for the Americans to park their tanks was in fact great monuments like Ur um, and Sesiphon. Um, there's, evidence, there's evidence to say by the Australian um, military um, that um, large tracts of the Sesiphon landscape were actually destroyed by the Americans as target practice in 2003. So, you know, um, I, I, got, I got very angry and I got very much involved. Um, and, um, and put it this way, my life was made extremely uncomfortable for the good part of six months. Um, but from that moment onwards, I, I started studying a lot more about this landscape. So I realized that the landscape of Tessaphon is not just one, one arch. Um, there are, there's the remains of um, park, walled parks and gardens. There's the remains of a mosque. There's the remains of a church. There's remains of a wall. Um, there's various other things. And, um, and obviously, um, the damage caused by the Americans um, offered us more um, evidence as well. What would be happening is that the Americans would be using some tombs from all different periods as target practice. Uh, these tombs would be opened and obviously burials would be exposed. 
and wonderful objects from as far back as the B Babylonian landscape were to be revealed. Um, and lots of the landscape would be looted by American <coughs> servicemen and likewise. Um, so again, hence the interest. And at the same time, I was also doing my, uh, my uh, first master's degree with the uh, University of Leicester. And because this whole thing started me, making me feel ill, um, I had to drop out of the course back then. Um, hence why I had to go on to do another master's degree. So this is the aerial <coughs> view of the Arch of Sesiphon. Um, and what you can actually see is the arch at the back here. Um, again, it's not a brilliant view, but this is a military um, image. Um, if I'd been caught with this image back in the day, um, yes. But anyway, um, the, the, art, the, the, front, the facade here is still standing. Um, and under the patronage of Saddam Hussein, they were going to actually rebuild uh, the other side completely and rebuild the arch. But unfortunately, there was the illegal invasion and the reconstruction project um, was never, ever completed, uh, which is a great shame, really. Um, and you can tell a little bit of bitterness is that I would have been involved in this project as well to re uh, reconstruct this site. But again, that never happened. Again, so um, looking at, um, again, this, this, it's actually known as the Tak Kasra um, Arch, um, but it, we, everyone properly knows it, knows it as the Arch of Kassesiphon or Tessiphon. And I've actually done a video on this as well, um, a very successful video. I've got, um, I've got my videos on YouTube, and if you ever want just a video that looks at the Arch of Tessiphon, go to my um, YouTube account and you actually see a whole video about it. Uh, except you see people criticizing me saying it's not the arch of Ketsesiphon, it's the arch of Tessiphon. Um, but again, I feel it is a wonderful monument and it is one of the greatest archaeological monuments on the planet. I know I joke every week and I read an article of the week saying this is the most important archaeological find ever. This is one of the most important archaeological monuments still standing on this planet. This is. No exaggeration. Um, and look at this wonderful little carving. Now, this wonderful little carving will take us on to the Battle of Edessa. Now, have you ever, ever heard of the Battle of Edessa, Keith? Knowing that you're so into your, your um, military, you visit the Battle of Waterloo every year. Uh, no, I haven't, actually. Is this the only year that you've not visited the Battle of Waterloo site? Probably. Probably. Yes, I, I know. I was only six months old when I first visited. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, now, the, now, this itself, why are we looking at this carving? Let, let's sort of blow it up a little bit more. Um, let's not literally blow it up. Actually, there is one thing. Um, the um, ISIS, were, ISIS did have plans to blow up the Arch of Sesiphon. Um, and why, I don't know, because the Arch of Sesiphon was actually converted into a mosque. They were actually going to blow it up. And if they had blown it up, um, the, the original um, lists, um, obviously there were many lists, the original lists of the um, seven ancient wonders, we would have lost this one. And probably um, other than one of the later lists, looking at the, the um, Colosseum in Rome and looking at the uh, Parthenon, um, you know, there'd be very few of the ancient wonders still standing, but they didn't destroy the Arch of Sesimum. Now this monument itself, is in Iran. It, it's, a, um, it's a monument describing something that we're going to go on to. Um, but looking at my notes, some of my notes that I haven't done, it's, it's known as the um, Sassanian Empire, the Sassanid Empire, the Empire of the Iranians. But um, live, if you would have lived in Iraq, you wouldn't have called it the Empire of the Iranians. You'd have called it the Sassanid Empire today. The Neo-Persian Empire, the Neo-Parthenian Parthenian Empire, uh, this is a this is a period of great Persian dominance. Um, the House of Sasan, uh, because it was named after the great Sasan. Um, the Sasian Empire, founded as we've uh, already said by Adashir the uh, first, a local Iranian leader who who rose from the par weakened Parthenon Empire, which had been constantly defeated by the Romans. 
And Adashir, and then his, late, his son later, would come on to destroy the Romans. A categoric defeat. Now this itself, this victory over the Romans is a far greater victory than Wellington's victory over Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. And I'm going to stick by that. Sorry. Um, and then what we do see, um, the period of Sassanid rule is considered a high point in Iranian history. And in many ways was the peak of ancient Iranian culture before the Muslim conquest and subsequent Islam in, um, Islamization. I, I'm struggling with some of these words today. The Sassanians um, tolerated the various faiths and cultures of their subjects, developed a complex, centralized government, a bureaucracy that would see the legitimization of Sassanid rule a unifying force, um, a period of great monument uh, building and a period of great public work building, um, a patronization of various cultures and educational um, institutions. The empire's um, cultural influence extended far beyond its territories into the Roman Empire. The word as well, this, this is the Western world. Western Europe, um, it would influence the likes of um, cultures in Africa, China and India, and help shape European and Asian medieval art. The Moors, everything that we see about the Moors comes from, well, not everything, but most of what we see about the Moors comes from the Sassanian world. Persian culture be became the basis for much of Islamic culture, influencing art, architecture, music, economy, literature, philosophy, you name it, it's there. And even down to new strains of wine as well. Uh, we mentioned wine when we looked at the Moors as well, so that's an interesting thing to mention. Um, so officially the empire um, is, is something of greatness, is something that we all need to know about, but none of us know about it. I know, I know Goff is probably shouting at the screen and saying, I knew about it. I knew all about it. Um, but um, this, is, this, this image itself is associated with the great Shapur, Shapur the Great, and he deserves his title. Now, in history, there are very few people that can describe themselves as great. I don't see Wellington calling himself Wellington the Great or Napoleon the Great. Um, Emperor Napoleon, not, but not Emperor, not um, Napoleon the Great. Um, and in fact, you don't see Julius Caesar the Great either. Um, you see Constantine the Great. Um, but then again, you don't see many other Roman leaders that have that title. But this is Shapur the Great. Now, Shapur the Great reigns for 30 years. Now, this is, this is basically not the greatest period in Sassanid um, in the Sassanid Empire, but this is the period where he takes the war um, to the Hindu Kush, where he takes the empire into the landscape of the Indian worlds. Um, and then um, he reigns from 240 to 270. And this is where we go to the Battle of Edessa. Not Odessa, because that's in the uh, Crimean, but Edessa, E-D-E-S-S-A. Um, and moving my screen in front of me, this itself shows Shapur with the arm, holding the arm of the great, um, um, great emperor Valerian. And Valerian has um, a legacy. Um, uh, there's a plant named after him, which we all see as a weed today. Uh, however, Valerian is an empire that sees his Eastern Roman Empire starting to collapse. This is another cause of the Seneca collapse. Um, and I did actually, I think I actually mentioned it when we looked at the collapse of the Roman Empire. I mentioned the Battle of Edessa, but I didn't actually go into detail, probably for deliberate reasons. Um, and that is the arm of the great emperor Valerian being held um, up in the air. Now, when you think about it, I was trying to explain, when you hold somebody's arm, you're controlling them. 
you know, when you see about, when you see abuse cases in court, the man held my arm um, and he, he controlled me with my arm. And, and when you see that the epitome of controlling the arm is seen in this stone carving, um, uh, Shapur is holding the arm um, of the great Emperor Valerian. And there you see a Roman um, general um, at the feet of the horse, at the feet of Shapur. This is all um, associated with the Battle of Edessa. Now, for many years, um, um, Adashir and then Shapur, who defeated the Romans at the Battle of Edessa, saw the constant defeats uh, that the Parthians were having to cope with. The Parthians were having to pay tribute to the Roman Empire. And enough was enough. Now, what you do see in empires is empires are usually defeated. Um, you see the coalition defeating the great empire of Napoleon um, in, in, um, in, the eight, in 1814 and then in 1815. Uh, you do eventually see the great um, Adolf Hitler uh, being defeated. Uh, by the Western world. This time, the Eastern world defeats the Western world. The Battle of Edessa. Now, what we do see um, is, um, as, we, as we go into this, my notes on the screen, the Battle of Edessa took place between the armies of the Roman Empire under the command of the Emperor Valerian and the great um, leader, Shapur in the year 260. Uh, the Roman army was defeated and captured. Its entire force was surrounded by the Persians um, and, was, and it was all, every single Roman soldier was, was either dead or taken captive. There's nothing like this being seen in history. Everything that you see in the Roman world was placed onto its head. You know, when you look at the Vertingetorix, the great conquest of those 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 tribes of, of Gaul under Julius Caesar um, 300 years earlier this this was now to be history turning itself on its head but there had been a defeat of the Romans um, that had been similarly as great as this but not as great as this the, the, the defeat um, in the Teutoburg forest in the year AD 9 so so these are the facts. These are the great facts of this. Let, let's sort of uh, read from my other screen. Um, I tell you what, if we take my if we take my camera over here, you can see me. You can see me again. Um, so what we've got, we've got um, in his sixties, Valerian marched eastwards to the Sassanid borders and invaded the Sassanid Empire. The, if the Romans had, had defeated the Sassanid Empire it would truly have been the greatest empire this planet had ever seen. Actually, people would say that the Roman Empire was the greatest empire this planet had ever seen. Um, I actually disagree with that statement. But if the Romans had defeated the Sassanids, the great Valerian would not have only created the greatest empire on the planet ever, ever. That is without doubt. The, the Valerian would have been the greatest Roman emperor ever, you know. He would have been greater than Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had been a, um, a dictator, but you know the, the point. He would have been greater than uh, his, his, um, his descendant, um, Constantine the Great, um, under 100 years later. So this was his moment in history. So being that this was his moment in history, he would gather Roman soldiers from all corners of the Roman Empire. In fact, 70,000 soldiers. This was as large, if not larger, than um, Napoleon's army at Waterloo at 68,000. This was truly great. This wouldn't be as great as the invading force in, in France uh, in 1940, but nevertheless, this would be 70,000 men. Remember, you've got to feed them. This is a huge army for the Romans. Um, according to Shapur's inscriptions, um, Valerian met the main Persian army under the command of Shapur the Great between Kare um, and Edessa uh, um, in Persia with units from almost every part of the Roman Empire. 
together with his Germanic allies, because you, you can imagine this, that um, his Germanic allies are thinking, the, you know, we're part of this army and we have been defeated finally. Uh, the, those people that have enslaved us to fight against another empire has been, in, has, has been defeated itself and was thoroughly defeated and captured. The entire force, the entire force, you know, there, there are very few comparisons in history other than, um, other than Vertingetrix um, defeat at Elise. There's, there's few parallels to this. And nobody's ever heard of this. Nobody. Okay, I know Goff has, but other than that, it's, 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 it's amazing. So according to Roman sources, which are not very clear, the Roman army was defeated and besieged by the Persian forces. Valerian subsequently tried to negotiate. And again, the, the, the Romans fell into one of their own traps. So what Shapur said, he said, uh, Shapur said, come over here, my, my lovely. We'll have a little bit of a chat in a tent. Only that Valerian was captured in this tent. You know, a Roman subterfuge turned against the Romans. Um, and then basically Valerian, um, Valerian asked his entire army to surrender. And being that these are Romans, they actually surrendered. What more could they do? You know, Valerian went to a peace conference um, with Shapur um, because Valerian's forces had been um, surrounded and basically surrendered his entire army. Those that were dead surrendered the entire army. But there is something, the word dead, the word dead, there is something, there is something very, um, very powerful about this. Because Valerian, Valerian's army um, um, had been overtaken by a great plague. In fact, this was an army of the walking dead. Um, and I you know, Valerian had no other choice than surrender his army. Um, there might have been the fact that Chapur had said, look, look, mate, I've captured you now. Um, your army's dying anyway. You know, we can offer our physicians to help your army. Um, and maybe there's something of, of su surrendering the army for the better good because the army would have died anyway because of this great plague that... Um, you know, it was facing. Um, it, and, and Shapur um, is saying that Shapur went back on his word in the negotiation, seized the empire, um, and that was it. Uh, seized the emperor. and could have seized the empire. If, if, if the Sassanids had invaded the Roman Empire at this point, it would have captured the entire empire. It would have. There's no doubt about it. The Roman Empire was at its knees. And at that moment, from the 260s, the, the Roman Empire was to collapse, except it would gather itself back together under Diocletian in 300, um, and things would, things would last for another 150 years or so. But um, what would happen is that it was at this moment, a decade and a half later, in the year 286-287, that a fella known as... Um, um, Carausius would lead um, a usurper throne against the Romans to actually proclaim a British empire for, which would last about seven years actually, only to be recaptured and, and defeated by the Romans uh, in the year 296. Um, however, um, lots of things would fall apart all due to this event. And again, who had heard of this event? This is more influential than the, uh, the victory that Wellington had at the uh, Battle of Waterloo. Um, there are varying accounts uh, as to Valerian's fate, uh, uh, following his capture at the hands of Shafu Shapur. Um, one, of the, one of the stories, and I know some of you might know this, uh, but not know that it's associated with this. Uh, one of the stories would be, and if we change the image. Um, oh, look at that there. There we go. By the way, the battle is actually taking place in southeastern, um, southeastern Turkey, for those that don't know where this is. So if I, if I zoom in on this, um, Ellen gives her apologies today um, because she's got a man coming in. She didn't explain any more than that. So mm. there you go. You've got an Itaglio there. Um, so one of the stories is, is that um, 
um, Valerian is you is used as a footstool um, for Shapur. Shapur uses him as a footstool. He blinds Valerian. And Valerian, for the rest of his life, is a footstool. Um, that's a nice story for those that don't like the Romans and um, are glad that the Roman Empire has collapsed or is collapsing or somewhere along those lines. Or the Roman army is finally defeated. I won't tell Alan because he will get upset. Some scholars claim Shapur um, sent Valerian and some of his army to the city of Eshapur. Um, where they lived in relatively good conditions. Shapur used the remaining soldiers in engineering and development plans as the Romans were skilled tradesmen and artisans, as we know. Um, and there's a, there's a site in, um, at the, the ancient city of Susa, which I'm sure that Goff has docked at. Um, there they built a great dam known as Caesar's Dam. And that dam was actually built by Roman engineers. So they built this great dam. So in other words, the Roman army was put to good use. Have you, have you noticed that they weren't enslaved? Now the Romans would have enslaved the assassins if it had been the other way. There's a difference. According to another source, the Roman writer Lac Titanius, Shapur humiliated Valerian using the former emperor as a human stepping stool while mounting his horse. He was reportedly kept in, in a cave and ceremoniously urinated upon by Shapur on a regular basis. Yeah. There's another story by um, Aurelius Victor. Um, upon his death, Valerian's body was allegedly skinned and stuffed with, depending on which account, manure and a straw to produce a, a trophy of Roman submission preserved in a Persian temple. There's another story at the back of my mind saying that the Romans did try to invade Persia again to get Valerian back, but I'm not sure how much of that story is true. However, there are also accounts that stipulate he was treated with respect and that allegations of torture may have been fabricated by Christian historians of the late antiqu antiquity period to show the perils that befell persecutors of Christianity. Um, so in other words, um, don't have anything to do with these people because they're evil. Um, and he was um, ceremoniously um, um, raped as well, but um, let's not go there. Following Valerian's capture, Shapur took the city of Caesarea and deported some 400,000 of its citizens to the southern provinces of the Sassanid Empire. But they lived. They weren't enslaved. They lived. They lived somewhere else. He then raided um, Calicia. Um, but he was uh, finally repulsed by a Roman force that had rallied um, at the Battle of Pi uh, Palmyra. And we all know about Palmyra. Um, that was the place that um, those damnable um, Islamic state um, destroyed the, the great remains at Palmyra. Um, but the Sassanids ironically were defeated um, at Palmyra. Well, when I say ironically, that's another great city when you look at it in comparison to Sassifan. Valerian's defeat at Edessa became the catalyst for a series of revolts and, and temporary fragmentation of the Roman Empire in the East and the West. Um, uh, but eventually the whole world would be united under Rome, which would last um, for 150 odd years yet. I, I love this. Um, I love this fine cameo showing an equestrian single combat between Shapur and Valerian, in which the latter is seized again, seized at the wrist, according to Shapur's own statement. With our own hand, does Shapur capture Valerian? And actually, maybe there's some fact in 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 this 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 sort of maybe what happened is that they both met on a horse and Valerian grabbed the hand. No, start again. Shapur grabbed the wrist of Valerian um, in an act of placing um, Valerian under submission. Um, and then Valerian dropped his sword and he said, you have captured me. I, maybe that's it. Maybe Valerian reached out his hand in friendship. You remember that um, you remember that story about um, Alexander the Great and Darius, 
where Alexander the Great holds out his hand in friendship with Darius. Um, you know, Darius is on his chariot and Alexander the Great is on his horse, that type of thing. But this time, this isn't going to happen. Shapur moves history around and grabs the wrist. He's not going to shake the hand of a Westerner. Very powerful um, symbol of Sassanid conquest. So there we go. We're going to look at uh, we're going to look at uh, the arch of Sassafon. There I am back again. You can see me. I I. It's almost as if the only reason some of you come to my classes is just to look at me. Keith's in that boat, and so is Pam. Certainly. I'm glad you agree with that one. <laughs> now we're now going to look at. Um, oh, there's the mouse. There it is. Um, Sassafon. Um, and let's put a little cross on there. There we go. So we're going to look at Sassafon and next week we're going to go to a site very near Baghdad as well. Uh, so, so remember where we are. So Sassafon itself, again, is something that I, I would love to one day see, but um, due, to my, um, due to my background, I don't think the Iraqi authorities would let me in the country. Um, so there you go. Oh, did I just show you another image? Yes, I did. Yes. Um, there's more of it. Um, uh, yes, the image behind me. So, um, what happened in a, a lot the gone? Standing there? on the top of the arch, aren't they? Yeah, they were exactly. So we'll come to that in a moment. Um, so this arch itself is known as the Arch of Sesiphon, otherwise known as the Arch of Takhaza. Uh, Takhaza um, is, is the, actually the name of this palace, but it's in the city of Sesiphon. That's what nobody can pronounce, Takhaza. Uh, but um, this Arch of uh, Sesiphon uh, is, is, is one of the greatest monuments on the planet. If somebody said, which monuments would you like to preserve on this planet? This would be one of them. Because this tells us of gr the great um, architecture of the Persian world. The great feat, the, uh, again, in my notes, let's not ad lib, considered a landmark in the history of architecture and is the largest single span vault of unreinforced brickwork, of unreinforced anything other than concrete on this planet. It, it's, it's an amazing feat. It's an amazing monument. 37 meters high. Let's give you a few other facts. Built sometime in the reign of Adashir. So we're looking back sometime 230, somewhere like that. It, the, the great arch itself is actually um, an audience chamber. It's an open audience chamber. You can imagine that. Gaily decorated. Um, everything is gay about it. The gaiety of colour. The gaiety of the great landscape of the Sassanids. And then it puts a little bit of light on the Islamic world. And what we're talking about is that when people think about the Islamic world and the modern history, they see the Islamic world as a very blood curdly landscape. And if you've seen any films like um, a Lawrence of Arabia, you see the, the damnable um, Arabic Ottomans. Um, um, they, they actually, the Ottomans didn't see themselves as Arabic, but you know the point. The, is the, the Islamic Ottomans being damnable and they will do anything to do despicable things to people. But that's really a wrong image. Um, it's an unfair image. Because when you've got that image, you, you almost as if you dismiss everything um, that Islam gives to us, everything that the Persians give to us, everything that the Sassanids give to us. Um, and this great structure survived. The Byzantines invading the Sassanid Empire and capturing the capital of the Sassanids in the 540s that actually survived it. But if you squint your eye and think of other buildings around this landscape, you can hear the river uh, Tigris as well. Um, you can see great walls. But the one thing that you can see above all 
is the towering arch. It was an open arch. That's what we're saying. There was no frontage to this. It was an open arch. It was, it was projecting to the world, to us today, that this is a great monument indeed. A very, very great thing. And I love it when we look at, um, when we look at footsteps, actual real footsteps in stone. And this is what this monument is. If, if you see a sign of history, this is up there. Um, uh, this, this, is one of the, this is one of the little signs of, of the signpost. Um, it, it, this, this is a moment in history. This is, this is a benchmark. Um, so to give you a little bit of detail, the, the, the audience chamber, the, the, the palace room, the throne room, um, the arch behind it. Um, so, so basically itself, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting build. It's all made out of stone. And, and luckily enough, where those three individuals are standing, we, we have the carved stonework. There was, there was some carved stonework carried by the arch as well. Um, but in 1888, there was a great flood from the river Tigris. Tigris, all right, then let's be a bit common. Um, and it, 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 um, it, the flood washed away the facade and in doing so, the collapse of the frontal arch. This was all one arch at one point. Um, so let's give you a few facts. facts. Um, so, Okay, let's get the measures out there. Let's let's sort of um, let's let's do this. So um, from top to bottom, thirty-seven meters. Okay, um, the frontage is twenty-four meters in in width. Um, so it's a twenty-four meter span by um, by by thirty. Um, by 37 meters in height. And it's saying as well that from front to rear, um, the arch is, is 50 meters in length. Actually, there are some varying figures in front of me, but I'm giving you the, the ultimate. Now, also, um, if you can get an idea of thickness of the arch, um, it varies in front of me because we don't actually know this thickness proper but it's about three meters thick by about seven meters thick um, on the base. So this, this is actually carries the weight. However, um, what carries the weight? If any of you know anything about architecture, what carries the weight is the facade. So the displacement of the weight goes out into the facade. So this area here doesn't carry the weight. So there's no pressure placed on these bricks. So the weight is offset by the facade. So you can imagine without, without if, if, oh, if only, if part of this had survived, it would have collapsed anyway. Um, uh, the plan was in the 1980s. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to underplay this, but I'm, I'm a little bit of a plan. I, I, I'm a little bit of a fan of dictators, if you haven't realized. Uh, when we did our lectures on uh, Mussolini and his patronage of archaeology, that billions of pounds were placed into restoration works and anemi boats and all the rest of it, Saddam Hussein did the same. Um, I could be very cautious about saying the same about Adolf Hitler. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, great dictators usually put a lot of money into archaeology. And this, the, this, this, this right half was going to be completely restored, and so was the front arch. Babylon was completely restored as well um, under Saddam Hussein. Um, but what, what we do see is that this was never completed because you've got the first Gulf War in 1991. Uh, money was placed back into it, but the work was never completed. Um, but, you, but even today, even today, I, uh, the, the site is very great. Um, in, in what you see. Um, what are these little holes here? Now, there's a bit of an argument in my own mind with this. I'm actually thinking that maybe um, these, these actually stretch across. But then again, that would take away the majesty of the arch. So what these might be is actually um, constructional um, logs, putt logs. Um, and as, as this is being created, um, the frame, um, the frame is, is, these are actually carrying the weight. 
because if if the um, if the frame itself is carried from the base, there would be subsidence. That there would be too much weight placed into um, the floor from the construction of the arch. So it makes sense as the arch is being constructed that these holes themselves are actually carrying the weight. But in one illustration, it actually counteracts that argument. But that's where I'm going to go with this anyway. Even the reconstruction is based on what somebody thinks. Um, so I may actually take a break in a minute. Um, I would actually like to complete um, a little bit more of this. Um, and that's what I will do. And then we'll come back to this arch after the break. Oh, a little bit too much, but we'll go back to those images actually. So uh, again, the la it, again, the largest vault ever constructed in the world or, um, or the largest man-made freestanding vault constructed until modern times, because we've got concrete vaults with, with the addition of, um, of re re reinforced concrete. You, you've got um, iron framework in there, right? Uh, up until modern times, this is a great, this is a great wonder. It's still a great wonder. Uh, so in order, uh, in order to make this um, possible, the construction of this, uh, a number of techniques are used. The bricks were laid about 18 degrees from the vertical, uh, which allowed them to be uh, partially supported by the rear wall during construction that I've basically mentioned anyway. The quick drying cement used as mortar allowed fresh bricks to be quickly supported by those that were previously laid. So basically what we're talking about, overnight there's not going to be a displacement of weight if you lay one course and you leave it, another course and you leave it. What you've got to do, you've got to think about displacement of, of the weight and settlement whilst, whilst this thing is being constructed. And you need to be able to deal, deal with those changes as the bricks are being laid. So they need to be laid quite rapidly. The Takasra um, is now all that remains above ground, basically of the entire city. There's bits that stand above ground if the Americans had and bloody destroyed them. Um, and you can tell I'm not a fan of the Americans. Um, and this, this was very much in use after the city had been captured by Mahmadins. Um, after the um, 651, it was used as a mosque, a perfect mosque. And then you can work out why you get mosques and minarets uh, when, when you get the domes, um, when, you know, this is what you see. Um, it's all based on um, Sassanid architecture. And there's another piece of evidence to show you that in a while. Um, so the structure left today was the main portico of the audience hall. Um, again, another that they can't work out in my notes, what the, but obviously it's the same thing. Um, who maintained the, uh, the same site chosen by the Parthians for the same reason? Uh, the structure was captured by the Arabs in, in 637. I said 651, but that's when the Sassanid Empire collapsed, so 637. Uh, they used it as a mosque until the entire city uh, was completely abandoned. Um, basically, within years, by about 900, the entire city was abandoned, except um, lots of the bricks were actually taken away um, to be used in a construction of the Tak um, Palace, um, um, the extension, um, well, the original building that looks at uh, Saddam Hussein's palace in Baghdad um, that you see footage of in 2003. Uh, bricks were actually used in the construction of the Great Palace of Baghdad, the, the Taj uh, Palace, um, but this actually remained. The monument is also the subject of a poem by Hakatin, uh, um, from the 1100s, which I've tried to look up, but I couldn't find. On that note, um, I'm not exhausted this week because I haven't had to put up with Kathy moaning, um, but I'll have to put up with it in a bit moaning. So any questions from, uh, why am I picking on Kathy? Because I love her to bits. Um, and uh, I can't wait to see her next week. So um, are there any questions from you, uh, Keith? No, I don't think so. No, it's all interesting so far. Are there any pictures of uh, what was around uh, this particular uh, site, or these buildings? No, no, uh, no uh, that's original. All that's left. The, the, that's all the, that's left. That's more or less all that's left. We we do have some ground. We do have some ground stuff. You know, walls that stand two or three meters. But 
you know, 37 meters is a lot to sort of, um, you know, <laughs> compete with really. So we don't, we don't actually have that, you know, if there's any remains over 10 meters, it, it's, it's, it's not classed as substantial. Basically, this is the only free, ah, that's the word, this is the only freestanding structure left at um, a yeah. from, from the original city. That, that's the word I'm going to look at. And if you look at the back of this, the back wall itself was that what, what actually gave um, structural um, support to the rest of the art. So there you go. So let's have a few questions. Um, I can't wait. And somebody's joined us. Um, Ellen's joined us. Oh, I, I love to see you, you witch, Ellen. Um, and I said, oh, Chris, um, I won't call you a witch, Chris, because I, uh, I, I like you. <laughs> Apologies for being late. I had a visitor. <laughs> uh, I know. I, I love Ellen. I, I, I love Ellen to bits. Ellen told, uh, well, actually, the excuse that I gave for Ellen earlier on, that sordid excuse is not the real excuse, naturally. Um, and um, Ellen, um, Ellen's been waiting in for a parcel or something like that, I can't remember. Anyway, um, any questions from you, Sue, uh, quickly, darling? Um, just, um, you mentioned that um, dictators have this sort of uh, habit of building themselves monuments, and I couldn't help but think that, do you think uh, Trump Towers is going to stand the test of time? No. <laughs> um, now, could I, can I just not, can I not enter the answer to that in my defense. I'm not going to defend my attitude towards dictators uh, because there is an actual, there is another reason. If I was, a, if I was in 1930s Italy, um, I, I would have my own house. Uh, I would be on a lot of money and I would be e to excavate any site I like. Um, the same, same in Iraq as well. The, the money was pretty good working in the Baghdad Museum in 2003. Um, but anyway, um, but the, the other thing as well is what these dictators are doing in most cases, they're not building new monuments to themselves like Donald Trump. They're bu building monuments to enshrine the past. Mussolini, what Mussolini wanted to do was to build a, a new empire. So by displaying the Nimi boats, what he was saying is that our empire is going to be like the Roman Empire. But unfortunately, Mussolini would have had to have conquered Spain. He would have had to have conquered France. Um, he would have had to invade Britain and, and you know, obviously he was never going to achieve it. Um, so anything from Chris? No? Okay, Ellen? No, I only just got here, so I missed it all. Sorry. Oh, the recording is out in dispatches. Goff, you know, I mentioned in the Arabian Gulf and, 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 and all that. You have naturally been there, haven't you? Yeah, I've been there. Have you been into the port of Susa? Pardon? Have you been to the port of Susa? No. Right, okay. I thought you may have because whenever I mention you, you've usually been to all these places. Um, <laughs> well, Iraq's only got those two ports. Fair Basra enough. And Basra. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. On the Got you. Got there, you. Was an, there, there was an interesting program Thank on you. the Sassanids a couple of, about a month ago on the telly. Do you know what? I'm hearing this a lot. I'm doing a subject and somebody said that was on TV last night. <laughs> I do actually plan these lectures months in advance. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for that, Chris. I, it really makes me feel great. I, I, yeah, great. Pam, anything from you? You, you witch. Uh, yeah, after the break, can you explain a little bit about the illegal invasion? A little bit. Uh, well, you got in 2000. After well, I'll, I'll do it now. 2003. Oh, okay. Yeah, 2003. The, the, um, when, when we invaded Iraq and, uh, Yes, it, it, put it this way, um, you know, I, I can remember, I can remember <laughs> having my phone tapped. It was quite strange having conversations with somebody and, and hearing somebody say in the background, oh, he's talking now. And it was just like, great. It was, um, talk about paranoid. It was a, a strange period in my life. Um, so I'm going to unmute you guys. Um, so I think that was what you were asking. So I'm trying to unmute. No, they are not unmuting. Okay, we're gonna to have to forget Karen's house because nobody's unmuting. Okay, nope. Okay, we've got no questions from Karen's house. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna uh, we're gonna take a break um, and go from there. Thank you. Okay. Okay, son. 
and, and, and let my son, you've got to be very good with yourself nowadays. Don't don't play with girls. They're bad news. That's what my mommy always told me. Yeah. Many times. And they or don't each wash. time, I should say. And they, and, they, <laughs> and they don't wash. Okay. Time for coffee and cakes. Uh, yes, you can. And by the way, um, Chris, Chris did bring a wonderful cake along um, on, on Thursday. It's except he ate it all to himself. <laughs> So uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Kathy next week. Um, you know, I haven't heard of, I haven't heard from her moaning in months. Anyway, see you soon. <clears throat> Hello, Chris. Fancy seeing you two days running. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I um I I was late starting, so I didn't say anything to Carl about your trip oh, to Bristol. Sweet, right. Yeah, no, he he rang me last night. So I did say yeah. Mm -hmm. I told him last night where I was going, so I'm going to just stop back. All right. I got up at five o'clock. Oh my lord! Did you pick it up? The table yeah, chair? Oh no, yeah, it's lovely. Oh. It's nice, yeah. Was it an indoor one or an outdoor? Uh, it's indoor and recording. So here we go. I'd like a cup to make a couple of announcements. Um, there are a few of you wanting to go on a Dennis Powers walk. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was warned about this Ronda thing a little while back. Um, so that's why we're living at our parents, my parents in Barry. There is something going to be happening in the Vale of Glamorgan, but not yet. So we might still be able to do the walk on the 6th. Yeah. Um, if people want to do the walk and there's going to be a shutdown in the Vale of Glamorgan, I will give you all work travel passes and you can show that to the police and say that <coughs> for Archaeology Cymru. So that's how we're getting around things uh, anyway. Will, will there be a lot of police? I mean, are they increasing in numbers? No, they're not. <laughs> They're not, no. No, it's a bit of a strange one, isn't it? They're only checking people on main roads. Um, I've had to give, um, you know, there's, there's one person going on our trip to, um, who has to trip to um, Cornwall who's got to travel through. I've had to give her a work travel pass. So uh, anyway, um, I just mentioned that um, we will, there, we, there is going to be another date for the portable library again. If there's going to be a lockdown in the Vale of Morgan, we'll just issue Rosamond with a work travel pass to get to you. Uh, there are a few people who are um, wanting to go on our York trip. If anyone's interested in that, need to have a chat with me afterwards. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing um, Kathy next week. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be looking at the um, civilization of Ur. Um, and there is only one person who hasn't um, re-registered. And that person's name begins with a K. So yeah. I won't say who that person is beginning with a K, but um, make sure she Thank renews God. very soon. <laughs> and, and she's got a cackle. It's like a witch. <laughs> anyway, thanks for everybody renewing. Um, and that's that. Um, and what I'm going to do, these articles of the week, because I've got over 50, I'm just going to read just some this week and some next week. Start off with this one. Archaeologists will train amateur metal detective enthusiasts. English Heritage has got £50,000 um, to pay archaeologists to help train metal detect enthusiasts how to metal detect properly. Um, the answer is don't go metal detecting on scheduled ancient monuments. Um, and obviously a few other things and that's fine so here we go offers dyke offers dyke is latest ancient site to fall victim to vandalism oh bloody hell they don't they keep talking it's like, it's like oh, right it's like listening to a french brothel in action with that lot so offers dyke is the latest ancient site to fall victim to vandalism um people with diggers <laughs> Um, dug up a 50 meter section of Offers Dyke in Chirk um, to obtain soil for their gardens. And oh. they can get away with that damage as long as the people uh, can turn around to say that they didn't know it was a scheduled ancient monument, at which point they can get away with damaging the monument. Unless there's a sign put up there, unless there's a sign put up there saying that people can't damage this site. Um, 
And if, if the person can't read also, they can also get away with damage in an archaeological site. That's the way the law works. There's only been only one prosecution since um, CADU has been established in 1984 that led to a... Um, well, actually, it wasn't CADU. It was in England. There were, there were two people imprisoned, um, I think, at the beginning of this year for damage in an archaeological site. That's, those are the first in history. So the protected ancient monument laws are not worth the paper they're written on. The Enderthals have a bone to pick with critics. Uh, basically, they found a bone uh, that had been deliberately broken to be used for varying purposes. Um, and that's an object that they say proves that the Neanderthals were intelligent because they were able to make tools out of bones. Well, we know that the Neanderthals were intelligent. And whoever's got some background stuff on, stop it. Um, Hungarians descended from Afghans, not Attila. Uh, man reached America up to 30,000 years ago because there was no women with him. Obviously, things didn't continue. No, uh, 30,000 years ago, 31,000 years ago, at Chiquita um, Cave in Mexico, we now find that um, human beings were in America. I believe in the next decade, we will find that people reached America up to 70,000 years ago, like they did um, with um, the likes of Aboriginal Australia. Teenagers found, find 1,000-year-old gold coin hoard in Israel. Uh, another one here, Richard's victory on, is put on the map. They found the um, site of his victory, and people can now, find, now visit the, the, the site of Richard III's victory over the uh, Muslims and they, they've actually found the, the, the site there, the battle uh, of Arsuv uh, against Sahaldin uh, north of Tel Aviv um, so obviously a little bit after that Sahaldin defeats the, the, um, the Crusaders uh, first excavation and rookie found a horde, and there it is, look at that there, that, that, there it is he found a horde of these artefacts, an archaeologist, there he was working, what is it? Uh, oh, it's a socketed Bronze Age axe. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, axe head. Yeah. It's yeah, a, I know. It's on yeah. display at the London Museum now. They've got an exhibition there. <clears throat> oh, well, there I, you go. I, I could say that on the email. I could say for the Who the hell's talking? It's that blooming Chris talking to a boyfriend again. Um, here we go. Um, Basically, um, a flying, a flying dinosaur dated to 130 million years ago. The boy who dug up Roman coin hopes to make a pretty penny. <laughs> a coin, um, a, co a coin um, from the reign of Carausius. So that's a good one. Um, here we go. Uh, there, there it is. Um, the, the next article is play the thigh notes, but because I've got me on screen. That little um, coin there is, is actually a very rare coin. Mm. Make a lot of money out of it. And also, mm. just another one, they, they found out that, um, that priests in Judah were high on cannabis. Mm. So this, 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 thing, this thigh bone, uh, play the thigh bone, ancient whistle made from human leg bone dating precisely to 2,500 500 years BC on the 14th of August when the person died. A biblical fort, um, a Philistine fort, found in Israel, dating back to 3,201 and a half years ago. Calabrian oak tree is as old as um, um, Doomsday Book. Um, Calabria in Italy, a tree dating back... Um, to 1086 has been found. They know it was planted uh, at 1215 on the 14th of August. Mm. And finally, this is going to really wind Kathy up. Museum removes shrunken heads in revamp uh, yeah. of fascist colonial displays. They are no, gonna, no longer going to display the shrunken head at the Pitt Rivers Museum that have been at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford uh, for over 80 years. And they're removing all artifacts that have anything to do with a colonial slave Please. past. And to be honest with you, Stupid. right? To be honest with you, I'm going to say two things. The first thing is, by denying the past, these things 
you know, if you say, oh, for example, we didn't have shrunken heads and we didn't do these things, you know, people might start to think that it's okay to shrink people's heads uh, because we've got to be warned that things in the past are not good and we shouldn't do them in the future. and We should display these things in museums. Um, and massively, I'm a big fan of Red Lives Matter because I'm reminded that people got to these places before the white and the black man. Um, and one of, those, one of those movements that's growing strong is in America now that the Native Americans have had enough and said, this was our land before you guys. We want our history displayed. So I wanted to chuck that in there. So what we're going to do now, we're going to get back straight to the lecture before I actually show you some of the nice artifacts that we've uh, found. And for some strange reason, um, it's not just showing me speaking. So anyway, uh, a nice bit of late medieval uh, rim pottery. Mm, that's from Trellick, Trellick. is that? Yeah, that's from Trellick, found on the weekend. And also in the same trench, trench uh, a nice bit of window lead. You can't really mm. see it, but there's a groove down the window lead, which would be from one of the manorial buildings. I should be wearing gloves, actually, because this, this is lead. Um, lead oxide on it. Um, and then finally, before we go on to the lecture proper, um, a nice bit of iron buckle. Uh, and more of these bent nails. I was mentioning last week that we, we've got lots of bent nails um, that as they would have been um, um, hammered into the wood, they would have been bent over on the other side, evidence of a door, whatever this is from. Uh, mm. And also um, a nail from a horseshoe. Nice. Mm. So, uh, so let's get on to it. So this next bit, this next bit, we, we really put everything together. And, um, and I'm so pleased um, after so <coughs> many months, uh, we've got, we've still got a, a nice group of people in these classes. So, uh, uh, so let's crack on. So let's, let's go on to the, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut a few of your mics because I've had enough of Ellen's interruptions. And I've had enough of Suwin's interrupting. Um, and we'll have Goff and Keith. You know, do you know what, right? I love spending time with Goff. He, he reminds me of a sugar daddy I used to know. So <laughs> uh, anyway, back to, back to where we are. I think we've got a bit of a lag at this minute. So uh, let's just um, slowly, slowly. So this is that image that we, we mentioned um, and the um, Tak Kastra, um, you could talk, call it the um, Tak Kastra Mosque actually, because that's what it eventually became for a short period. Uh, this plan itself heading down from um, Baghdad. Um, and what you can see is a sort of vague outline of the, the city and the roads and stuff. So it was spread out um, in a wide area. So to give you an idea of the scale, that, that is the Tak, um, is Kasra, Tak Air -tac Kasira um, um, site. So that, that sort of gives you an idea that, that um, uh, this, this building here, to give you an idea of the scale of the other buildings, the palace of Ardashir. Um, and again, what, happen, what would happen is that there would be a circular wall um, within this area. So we've got a nice circular wall, uh, but because of erosion, uh, we've lost big chunks of this circular wall. What I'm going to do, I've got a little bit of feedback from Goff. So what I'm going to do is cut Goff's mic. I don't know why we got feedback from Goff today, um, but it's all been rectified. So large tracts of the landscape um, have been destroyed by erosion um, that you know the, the river moving so luckily the river has actually moved uh, in a westerly direction because if it had moved in an easterly direction we would have lost the arch of Sesophon but because it's moved in a westerly direction uh, we've obviously lost other big chunks of the city but um, the site is still with us today um, and again, very little of what's indicated on a plan can actually be seen on the ground today. And again, when we think of the um, Sesiphon landscape, we think of a very arid 
desolate landscape. But you can see all the water courses within this landscape today. Um, and you start to think, actually, you know, it's not a desolate, bleak, barren landscape at all. I know we've already seen this, but there is now a story associated with Roald Dahl. Now, what we do know, just a few, chuck a few facts at you. Um, in 1851, the French artist Eugène Flaudin um, also visited this site because he obviously visited the palace of Adashir and, and he gave us that illustration. Um, and this is what, um, this is what um, Eugène Flaudon said. He said that, um, that in 1851 of the um, Arch of Sesiphon, the Romans had nothing similar or of the type. So again, repeat that. The Romans had nothing similar or of the, of the, the type. So in other words, what he's saying is that this is, this is greater than anything the Romans is seen associated with the Roman period. Uh, the only thing that I can equate to this in the Roman period is the Parthenon, which is that dome. But naturally, this, this is, this is an arch itself that doesn't have the same supports that the arch, uh, the, arch uh, the, the, the dome of the uh, Parthenon in, in, in Rome. Um, so in, in 1940, Roald Dahl then um, undergoing pilot training at RAF Habinia near Baghdad, took an award-winning photograph using a Zeiss camera of the Arch of Sesiphon in Iraq, which was subsequently auctioned by the Dahl family. Um, it's in his own autobiography, he writes, you may not believe it, but when I was 18, I used to win prizes and medals from the Royal Photographic Society in London and from other places like the Photographic Society of Holland. I even got a lovely big bronze medal from the Egyptian Photographic Society in Cairo, and I still have the photograph that won it. It is a picture of one of the so-called seven wonders of the world. The Arch of Sesiphon in Iraq. This is the largest unsupported arch on earth. And I took the photograph while I was training out there for the RAF in 1940. I was flying over the desert solo in an old Hawker Hart biplane, and I had my camera around my neck. When I spotted the huge arch uh, standing alone in a sea of sand, I dropped one wing and hung in my straps and let go of the stick whilst I took aim and, and clicked the shutter. It came out fine. So the monument uh, was in the process of being rebuilt entirely by Saddam Hussein's government in the course of the 1980s because of they wanted to restore the, the fallen wing and they wanted to restore the arch. And actually, it would have been a good idea. But obviously, with the illegal invasion in 2003, um, all that work stopped. But they did actually have some funding um, from the Western world um, in 2004, and that assisted in repairing the damage caused by American tanks within this landscape and also a little bit of restoration work um, into this site. Um, so this site itself um, is still undergo of some large restoration works. And thank God ISIS didn't blow it up in um, 2013, 2014. But there it is now. That image was taken um, by an of an American serviceman um, at the arch again, give you an idea of scale. Um, I think this was in 2004. Um, and you can obviously see the restoration on the right, which actually looks pretty good. It's quite easy to restore this site, but unfortunately, um, what's restoration, what isn't, is really difficult to work out because mud bricks look all the same. So if you create a mud brick today and you slot it in, it's going to be difficult to work out if that's an original mud brick or but anyway, anyway that I'm, I'm clutching on straws there it's a great monument and that at the back would have obviously added extra support to the arch um, from any problems within the landscape and this is i i i didn't i couldn't get roald dahl's image because it's had the copyright naturally um but i'm sure uh, roald dahl's image would have actually been very similar to this And I actually, I think from that description, it actually flowed, fl flew, flew more into the arch than, than what we're seeing at an angle. 
But again, I, I, I'm, I'm loving this again. It, it really hairs on the back of my neck. This was taken in 1949. And again, mm, look at that. Astounding, isn't it? That is more astounding than, than the others. Yeah, it is mm. astounding. With the restoration work there, um, and it is actually near, there is actually a little bit further up in the northeast, you've got a modern town. Um, and it is outstanding. One thing I, I failed to point out when we actually did this um, on Monday um, was that I failed to point out um, the flying buttress on the, on the left. Because what they've done, they've had to, the main, the main, architecturally, the main thing to keep the arch up is this. And this is not necessarily the arch itself because the arch freestands by itself and it has for hundreds of years. The main thing, is, as long as they keep the facade in touch, the, intact, the whole thing will remain standing. And what they've done, they've added a buttress in the last 30 years, I think, to actually support the facade. So that's the only architectural addition. But so right too, astounding, a, a, a extremely brilliant, beautiful monument. Um, and then there is the museum, which is nearby as well. Mm. Um, before, we've actually got some reconstructed drawings coming up. Uh, and with the reconstructed drawings coming up, you can actually see that those holes in the side, well, when you look at an earlier image from um, 18, 1880 odd, what you see is the only holes that are showing uh, is the lower course. And I think over time, you know, the rendering, the, the, the putt logs, you know, scaffolding. Mm. Um, but in the artist impression, it actually shows within those areas carrying uh, bosses. So we could actually just, all of us could actually be right. Maybe the putt logs were um, putted in and bosses created from them and that would make more sense and there is actually some more ar ar architectural sense as well if you add a putt log if you know if you add a boss onto the exterior <coughs> of this arch um, it's going to add extra weight but if you actually add the boss the um, boss into the putt log then it's going to be integral to the weight rather than being additional to the weight so the one image that you don't usually see is an image actually of the rear um, of this monument. And if we zoom in on this, um, is it zooming in? Oh, a bit more. Hang on, just try and zoom in. So <coughs> don't worry, I've got the virus. I'm just, um, I'm trying to drink this. So you're looking at the back of the monument itself. And obviously, what you do find in the front is actually <coughs> a false window facade. Um, and you can actually see how impressive this dome is from the rear as well. This would have all been actually inside the structure. And the structure that you can see today would have been a, about um, four, or four or five times much larger in area than what is on display today but again what is on display today is magnificent again give you an idea of scale of this wonderful monument so when you say when i say the word false facade the, the windows actually don't operate as windows um but you do get, get the odd little doorway into it so obviously to get access to uh, the, the rest of the structure and you know, one thing that I actually love, I used to collect stamps. Um, Goff used to collect stamps. Uh, I know he did. Um, and uh, I, I, I used to collect stamps as well. I'm sure you've got a stamp collection as well, Keith. Yeah, my father did. Yeah, yeah. But wouldn't it be great if he had this stamp? Because this stamp is dated 1923. Now, this is, this is, in, this is relevant because we know the arch was still standing. The, the, other, the other arch in front was still standing in 1888 we also know that the other right hand side of the facade was standing before 1888 by 1923 it's gone so as a piece of evidence for the future we know that between that photograph being taken in, in the um, 1880s and uh, 1923 
that other part of the monument is actually gone. And stamps can be really useful. In fact, uh, people who actually just collect stamps of archaeological sites, I've got a tiny little collection. You see, you see, I like Palmyra as well. The, the main remains at Palmyra are now gone because they were destroyed by ISIS. And I know that they're on some stamps. So stamps is a good, good little collection to get an idea of changes in the past. Again, looking at this, this map as well, we've already seen this. You can actually see ancient Tigris as it's actually changed course. Several different courses. There would have been a lot, lot of water flowing through this. And actually, there would have been vessel access to the site for, all the way from Basra. So they would have actually been to, able to add supplies down the Tigris into this great city itself. A great city being supplied by water gives it an extra edge. And one thing, I, one thing I would like to say, which I haven't already said, before we look at this image, this is that arch that didn't really come out on that illustration. This is probably taken in 1887 before this collapsed. Um, one thing I, I, I would say um, is that this, this site itself unifies the people of um, the Sassanid Empire. And why? Um, it's something that um, the likes of um, the likes of Alexander the Great wanted to do. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was only um, the champion and leader of his empire for ten years. But if Alexander the Great had lived another twenty, thirty years, he would have stabilised this land, um, and it would have brought um, the, the the Hellenic people, um, the Indian people, the Afghan people, the uh, Persian people, all into one. And that's what the leaders of the Sassanids believed. Um, and you see that in the way they, they use other people's culture uh, in their own. And this, is, this illustration is, is wonderful for two reasons. Um, the, 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 that is actually stonework. So if we, if we look there, that's stonework. And this is the brickwork. You can see how the brickwork has eroded away. And the stonework, unfortunately, is putting pressure on the brickwork below. Um, and you can actually see the lines of brick. You can see one line of brick in the uh, vertical, uh, 18 degrees off the vertical. Another line, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, and the lines of brick underneath it. So multiple layers of brick, 20, 25 layers of brick, actually much more than that, actually to create the frontage of this arch. You can see a little bit better in, behind, actually. The arch behind is, a, is, a, is thinner than the one in front because it's having to carry the weight of the stonework. But again, you don't see this anymore. This is gone. And it's so, it's so good that we've got early photography to show us this because that doesn't come in with Eugene uh, Flader's work. Again, that is um, what you see today. It is, it is beautiful and it's difficult to actually um, really understand, um, really understand what this was like, but you can get a good image, an idea of it in your mind. There's the restoration work in the 1980s. Um, and obviously they're doing restoration work on the other facade and you've got this Betrus that's been placed in there as well. And that, you can imagine that as a palace now. You can see how that works as a palace. You can see that um, you, what you can, what, you know, what I was trying to say earlier on, I, I wasn't probably making myself too clear because I was, uh, I had a frog in the throat. But uh, one, one thing I wanted to show was that if, if these were actually attached to the arch, they would have added extra weight. But if these bosses were actually into the putt logs, they would have just been accommodated by the putt log and they wouldn't have added additional weight onto the arch and that's a really important um, thing to say actually but um but in the other illustration the 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 one the um uh, the uh, that very early photograph you actually see that these putt logs are filled in so it's a really difficult to work out what interpretation to go by but again going back to the archaeology the the idea that the landscape was once green well you fools the hanging garden of babylon um um, about um, 700 years before this was built, that was very green. And they just believed that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were just a large green garden um, in that supposed oas oasis of the landscape. But naturally, with just a little bit of water channeling, 
cisterns, culverts, and all the rest of it, like the Nabataeans that we see with Petra, uh, what you do see is is a lush, lush green landscape. Uh, but the other the other thing I was trying to make as well, you've got the tented people and you've got the civilized people. What the what the um, Sassanids are doing? they they're bringing uh, the, the the all those people together within this wonderful land. It's such a the the Sassanids are a greater problem than the Romans. Lots of lots of Western people have lots more in common. Um, not the language, but the sense of um, color of skin, uh, the sense of religion, uh, uh, and the sense of um, the sense of connectedness. But the Sassanids had various different problems. They had various different pe uh, people. Of, of cultures and creeds and languages and so on. So it was a, a larger task put, to put together, but they, their empire lasted a nice 400 years until it was taken over by a religion. So you can hardly say that it was conquered. And that is a really nice, but it doesn't take you much to leap from what you're seeing in the archeology span to the reconstruction. It doesn't take you much um, and that's basically the throne room, the, uh, the, the, the palace structure. And you can see how that works, the scale of the people here. Um, as somebody joke, jokingly said, you can't imagine this with a small throne. Uh, but then again, um, um, Ar Bashir didn't see himself as a god, and nor did his son Shapur, who defeated the Romans. They saw themselves as rulers like Alexander the Great, but unlike Alexander the Great, who thought himself as a god. Uh, but you can actually see in the reconstruction, they've done something very different. They've used the lower course of scaffolding to sort of say, actually, uh, there may have been beams above here that you would have had hangings down. Well, I'm struggling to see how that works, to be honest. Uh, what I'd like to do, I know um, I'm going to say that we will have aimed to finish just before uh, one. Um, but I would like to, I would like to say something about this wonderful site. This is the palace of Ardashir, constructed immediately in the moment of his assuming control of this new Sassanid empire. I haven't said something about Ardashir. He, he reigned, he reigned, um, alongside his father and slightly after his father over the kingdom. Uh, of the Persians, and then he basically said, "Sod this! I'm going to become, I'm going to become an emperor." So he reigned in total between 211 and 242, which is a nice 31 years. And he had time to build these monuments. Um, and this is rather interesting. You can see the three domes at the back, um, and I'll just get the cursor in there. I've got another plan. You've got one dome, two dome, three domes. It doesn't. It doesn't take much of an imagination to realize where Islamic architecture got their um, architecture from. Uh, and Islamic architecture is quite open. Uh, and you, <laughs> you can't deny that Sassanid uh, architecture um, isn't the same because it very much is. This is a great palace site. Even though that's 20 meters in height, it's still friggin' chunky. Um, I, I didn't. I haven't given much time to talk about this today, but I just wanted to give you another perspective, actually. And again, Ardashir and the representation of the orb um, above his head, the, the orb of power. But, but take away the orb, he looks, well, actually, he's a mixture between um, a portrayal of Arkhatatan in ancient Egypt around um, the one, 1500 uh, BC and he's a bit of a, a Babylonian looking bloke and he's a bit of a sort of modernist as well and he's got my big nose. Mm, I was gonna say that. No I said it okay thanks. Um, this is where Ardashir's palace is so in other words what we've got is we've got if you look at that there just just um just to give you an idea, um, the, the palace itself of Ardashir is hundreds of miles away from Baghdad. And then you think about, um, connection problem a second. And then you think about, I can't really see the screen properly, but, I, uh, but you've got, oh no, it's not there. So take that one. 
rub that out. Um, so what then you've got the the the, the city itself uh, of Sesiphon, uh, and you think that this is a large landscape. They put their palaces and their sense of control over the landscape. Now that's very that's very intriguing because what they're not doing is doing what the Romans did. All roads lead to Rome. What they what they did they had they had their Sesiphon. They they were also using. Uh, other places in the uh, seaboard of the Mediterranean, they were, they were leading all the way up into the Hindu Kush. They spread their cities and their sense of power, although it was centralized, it was uh, having all these offices and palaces spread out. And that's how they kept on to power. With, for example, when you look at most civilizations, they have one city and they put everything there. Well, it doesn't work. Um, hence why people in, in Cymru are very resentful about the English because all power is still in Westminster. Um, and I'm saying that because it was Owen England do a Welsh Independence Day yesterday. Sorry to get political. Um, we love the English really, uh, uh, Keith. Glad of that, glad of that. I wouldn't eat a whole one. <laughs> I can't upset you too much because Goff is English as well. So, um, so looking at this as well, um, you're looking at this and, and you, you see this is again an open audience chamber and it's all made of brick. So it's not just Sesiphon um, that's surviving. There are other um, monuments from this period surviving um, outside, um, outside um, Sesiphon itself. You can actually see that they've done a little bit of a reconstruction. There is actually three domes it should be there. One, two, three. The other one's not shown for a reason. And this is a reconstruction of the front. They're showing pillows and other things the way it should be, but not the typical Corinthian problem, um, columns, more like the um, Palinopolis um, type columns where you've got really t tall, slender pol uh, columns um, um, within this landscape. Oh, a little bit of politics. Um, um, I wanted to mention this. We, we, it's got a little bit to go. Um, this is this is um, issued from the um, Australian Ministry of Defence, and then what they basically said is um, they gave evidence against the Americans to say that they were using um, this landscape to um, park their tanks, and in doing so, damaging the landscape. And it's taken years for us to undo the damage that the Americans caused at this uh, archaeological site at Sesiphon. And the damage that they did to Ur is, is nobody's business. So when you look at this, you can actually see one of the domes, uh, which we will see show you in a minute. This looks very much like um, a smaller version of the Hagia Sophia. Uh, and this looks um, very much like um, the Pantheon in Rome. Um, and again, there's three of these uh, at uh, the palace of Ardashir. And look at these holes as well. The other thing as well is the holes may actually be, deep, they, they may actually be hollow. They may actually be um, displacing the weight of the dome as well. So there's other ways of looking at these hollows and, and these fills and these holes. You can see that again, you can see the domes again, and you can see how the facade would have been. And this would have all been nicely painted, nice steps leading up to it, fountains and so on. And there it is, you can actually see, uh, this is it from the reverse, you can actually see what a palace looked like. Now, if you look at Sesiphon, the palace at Sesiphon would have been two or three times larger than this. If you can get an idea what the palace of Sesiphon would have worked like. So you have the frontal um, audience chamber, and then you may have had that as an audience chamber or a throne room, but you've got a very large room at the back. And in this, you've got these three domed areas. And you can actually see that how the domed area had worked. Three domes, not one, three. Somebody said, were they building these to actually show off? And I'm thinking, well, they had the ability to build these things. Why not? You know, um, I sometimes think that the Great Wall of China is actually just to show off. Um, and you think about Hadrian's Wall as the same. So, you know, these people could do this and they did. Well, that's all we need to know. And actually, we've got the last image. And uh, I want your reaction straight away on this last image. The last image is from another um, um, Sassanid site known as Fashbarand. Um, Fashband. And, um, and look at that. 
what's your reaction, Keith? Uh, yeah, did we see that one earlier? Yes, that's it, isn't it? Yes, wonderful, yeah. isn't it? It's preserved, isn't it? Yeah, but get an idea of the scale. I made that. Yeah, monumental. Absolutely huge. Um, and all I want to say now, in closing today, because. I don't think there's anything more to say really other than the Sassanid Empire was one of the greatest um, empires we've seen on the planet. And in lots of ways, Islam, um, brackets, legacy, close brackets, um, um, tells you more about the Sassanid Empire, wait for it, than the Sassanids did themselves. Because we know about Islam, we know about Mecca, we know about uh, the, the great temple at uh, Baghdad, uh, we know about them, and they were all inspired, and the legacy, um, in many ma ways more than one, of King Sassan, um, Adishir, and Shapur, and the defeat of the Romans, and their monumental architecture like this, and their carvings. We're going to leave it there. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Keith? <laughs> No, no, that's fine. Oh, well, is that on its own in the middle of sort of nowhere? Um, that's on a rock face. Right, right. Um, that's part of, a, uh, part of a city complex. But yeah, that actually is displayed by itself in relief on the rock for everybody to see. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. thank you very much. So what I'm going to do, um, will Goff, anything you'd like to say, darling? No, other than that, again, just to say uh, we're very interested and very comprehensive thank you and one thing i would like to say um, is that anyone's joining our thursday evening tonight we are doing um, a, a complete hour on on looking at aerial photography identifying aerial photography so if nobody signed up to that course say say behind and have a word with me then um, and next week we're going to be doing uh, right i'd like to ask do these questions quickly sue anything you'd like to ask um they didn't look after their prisoners very kindly how were the ordinary people treated was there or do we not know well the answer is we do have some records and the other thing as well is is that um i would go in a defense they they treated their prisoners quite well they used the, the romans as engineers but um that anyway uh, yeah you, you nobody's really treated their prisoners good in history so i'm gonna go on oh. i'm gonna go on top of you on that one but i know, <laughs> I know i'm in yeah i know yeah. i'm inter interrupting too much um but well, uh, well they were urinating on on the the one that they had the leader that they had in prison they were you know raping him and urinating on him sort of like it's not nice is it but but then again that was written by the roman christian historian so is that true how would they know anyway were they there <laughs> um and no that, that's obviously only one instant and we don't even know if that's true or not so so anyway so there's that and uh, and obviously the people if you think about these building projects they would never have been able to build these projects and do these wonderful carvings without the cooperation of the people i would say the people have treated quite well um pam anything you'd like to say quick no i'm fine thank, thank you. you ellen thank you much. nothing from ellen she's fallen asleep what about um, you uh, chris um, just to say, Keith is asking about the big carving. I believe on the programme that they did the other month, there were other carvings elsewhere in, in the same sort of fashion of other leaders in the Sassanid Empire. Right, yeah. right, right. Well, you can tell I didn't watch that programme, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> See, you've, you've tripped yourself up on that one. Um, right, what we're going to do, we're going to have from the Motley Group, um, can you unmute yourself, please, darlings? Mute. No, well, so, somebody's just gone. Um, who have we just lost now? I don't know. So anything you'd like to say, folks? No? Yeah. Sorry, no. can I ask a question about earlier on? You said if you can't read, do you mean to say if somebody can't read, they don't have to obey any signs giving information or legal information? If you, if, in, in the, the, the reason why the antiquities law is so antiquated, if you can claim um, um, ignorance to 
um, the fact that these are protected ancient monuments, including not being able to read the sign, uh, you can get away with damaging the site because it's on the onus of CADU to tell you. The, the legal, the, ta oh, CADU okay. have to tell you it's a protected yeah, monument. It's a protected monument. So anyway, before it completely it's, breaks down, if we've it's got somebody else's land, you can't go nicking their land. Um, well, there will be no, tres no, 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 there no, no, are no, trespass no, laws that will stop that. Now there are trespass laws that will stop that. Um, well, we're talking about specific damage. I, I'm not really, I'm not really saying. Obviously, those people who, who I haven't actually read the whole Offers Dyke article, but we're saying that they claim that they didn't know it was an ancient monument. They could have had permission. I don't know. There's more to that. But anyway, so Ella, anyone else? Because anyone else from uh, Karen's house? No? Okay. No, no, no. So if anyone wants to chat afterwards, um, they can. I will see all of you tonight, who's, who's going to be joining us tonight at 7.30. If that's it, I'm going to say um, good day, see you next week, to Sue, <laughs> Keith, Chris, Pam, Goff, Ellen, um, Andrea, Catherine, Karen, Jim, and Chris. Take care, lovelies. Bye. 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 Bye, bye, Daddy. Bye, 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 bye Daddy. Bye, bye, son. Bye, bye. I'm missing bye, bye. you already. I know you are. Don't, don't worry. It's only going to be a week. <laughs> That's enough. That was over. Uh, that was crap. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Bye, bye, folks. Bye, bye. Take care. Right. Okay. Okay. That's it then. So I will see you lot in Karen's house soon. All right. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>